Polymer comes from the Greek words poly, meaning many, and me, meaning parts. And polymers are substances made up of what we call macromolecules, which are really large molecules. These can be both natural, so for example, DNA or synthetic, so made by uh, humans. And these macromolecules are composed of smaller repeating units, which we call monomers. And here we can see an example where these blobs represent the monomers and the whole chain represents the polymer. Polymers are synthesized in two main ways, so chain growth polymerization and step growth polymerization. So in chain growth polymerization, one monomer is added to the growing chain in every step, like so. In step growth polymerization, both the monomers and the growing polymer chains have reactive groups, which means that separate chains can join together, like so. So separate chains can form, and then they, those separate chains can join together. Chain growth polymerization can be achieved through several methods and in this video we will focus on free radical chain growth polymerization but there are also other ways of achieving this for example anionic and cationic chain growth polymerization. Now this involves what we call an initiator. So the initiator is a substance which basically kickstarts the polymerization but first we need to form the activated initiator so we need to form the radical um, the radical is denoted by the dot which represents the unpaired electron in this example we our initiator is a peroxidisulfate anion the negative charges and so what happens is we irradiate with ultraviolet radiation or heat it that then provides the energy to break one of the bonds and in this case it breaks this oxygen to oxygen bond homolytically so each oxygen atom receives one electron i.e they become a radical having an unpaired electron so we show this with fish hook arrows half arrows single headed arrows which represent the movement of one electron to each oxygen atom and then that forms two of these radical anions. In the initiation step this is basically where the first monomer unit reacts and it reacts with this activated initiator, this radical anion. So one of these double bonds in the alkene breaks by the movement of one electron to this carbon atom and the movement of one electron to form a bond with this unpaired electron on the oxygen. That then forms another lo longer chained radical with the dot there where the carbon is. Now This radical can then go on to react with more monomer units, more alkene molecules in propagation. Now this can happen many, many times. So we get, in this example, we get a long alkyl, a fluoro alkyl chain, which carries on and on until we, what we call quench the reaction, terminate it, which we'll discuss in a moment. Um, in, so in this example, we're forming polytetrafluoroethylene PTFE, which is an example of a um, forever chemical or PFAS, which we'll go on to discuss later. Now, in termination, to stop the polymerization, essentially, there are two main methods. Um, in this example, we will consider chain combination 
because the disproportionation isn't possible because it requires a hydrogen atom to be on the carbon adjacent to where the radical is, which we don't have. Um, we don't have a carbon to hydrogen bond in this example. Um, but anyway, for chain combination, basically what happens is the two of the radicals just combine and then a bond forms between them two of the chains combine and they bond together get a longer chain and that basically stops the reaction and then in disproportionation basically what happens is if we had a proton here it it would get deprotonated by this radical that would form the alkene and then this radical would gain a proton um, and then that will just form the uh, alkane. For every chemicals or PFAS are perfluoro and polyfluoroalkyl substances. These substances are found in the blood of around 99% of Americans um, for reasons we will discuss later in the video. Um, now, these forever chemicals have very interesting non-stick stain repellent waterproof properties which make them useful materials for example they, for example they're used in um, anything ranging from the waterproof coating on tanks to stain resistant carpets to not non-stick coatings on um, non-stick frying pans um, which brings us nicely onto PTFE, better known as Teflon, which is used as a non-stick coating. Now, this is because of its properties due to its structure. Now, PTFE and other fluoroalkyl substances are hydrophobic because while they do possess polar carbon to fluorine bonds, fluorine is more electronegative than carbon, these individual dipoles cancel each other out because the um, fluoroalkyl chains are symmetrical, which means that hydrogen bonds can't be formed between these molecules and water molecules. They're said to have weak adhesive forces, so the forces between these molecules and unlike molecules, molecules which aren't these molecules, are weak. Um, and they are also lipophobic, so again, weak adhesive forces. So they, these molecules are not very polarizable, which means that the electron cloud is not easily distorted because fluorine is very electronegative. It holds its electrons tightly, um, meaning that it can't be polarized, essentially. So, and London forces require good um polarization um so we cannot form significant strong london forces which means that these molecules do not attract lipids or fats very easily that, that they don't attract those molecules uh, which make them lipophobic which you know these are the reasons why it's used as a non-stick coating because it does not attract oils or water um, why they call for every chemicals that is due to the fact that the carbon to fluorine bonds are very strong 536 kilojoules per mole compared to a carbon to hydrogen bond of 337 kilojoules per mole and the f th these chains of fluorine atoms prevent the carbons from being attacked by nucleophiles for example they, they kind of shield those inner carbon atoms and these are why called forever chemicals because they aren't broken down very easily they persist in nature here we can see two more examples of PFAS the first being perfluorooctanoic acid or PFOA and the second being perfluorooctane sulfonic acid or PFOS now both of these substances contain a fluorinated eight-membered carbon chain with the only difference being the end groups. Now these are both used in firefighting foam um, and PFOA is also used in things like 
um, waterproof clothing. It's also used in the synthesis of Teflon and in electrical insulation, along with other uses. And PFOS, as well as being in firefighting foam, is also used as the main ingredient in fabric protectors to protect furniture and fabrics from stains and water, for example. The reason PFAS are of such concern is because they have been shown to have effects on our health. For example, an increased risk of some cancers, such as prostate cancer, endocrine disrupting properties, which means they affect our hormonal systems, increased cholesterol levels, which obviously can lead to things like cardiovascular disease, and studies have shown that PFAS can even increase the risk of type 2 diabetes. Better things for better living through chemistry. That was the slogan of the chemical company DuPont, who manufactured PFAS, mainly Teflon. But this wasn't the case for a West Virginian farmer named Wilbur Tennant, who noticed that his cattle were just dying without any explanation whatsoever. Tennant suspected that it had something to do with the old DuPont chemical plant, which was located near to his farm in Parkersburg, West Virginia. So Tennant contacted an old family friend called Robert Billot, who was originally from Parkersburg, but moved to Cincinnati, Ohio, and became a lawyer, and was a lawyer who actually defended chemical companies. So Bilot, using his expertise, travelled back to his hometown to investigate the deaths of tenant cattle. And he went round to the farm and tenant explained the incidents and showed him the evidence that he had gathered. And he eventually managed to persuade Bilot that there potentially was a link between chemical pollution from this old DuPont factory and the health effects that were being observed in his cattle. So Bilot eventually filed a lawsuit um, and investigated this further and actually obtained DuPont's documents, some of DuPont's old documents, which said that DuPont had been doing experiments on a chemical called PFOA, which we discussed earlier, perfluorooctanoic acid, which they used in the manufacturing process of Teflon or PTFE, polytetrafluoroethylene. They used it to manufacture that. But their studies, DuPont's own studies, um, linked PFOA exposure with health effects. For example, they did studies on rats and dogs and rabbits and found that increase in PFOA exposure led to an increase in liver size. They did experiments on pregnant women working on their Teflon, working their Teflon division and found that when these women gave birth, some of them actually gave birth to babies with birth defects. So DuPont knew about the effects of this PFOA, a type of PFAS. Um, but didn't alert the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, about this. And instead, they carried on disposing of PFOA and dumping it in the Ohio River. So they polluted the water with this potentially lethal substance and did not alert the EPA of the, the effects that it had. And Bilot basically discovered this in their own documents and went through uh, went through several lawsuits. Federal lawsuit was filed in 1999 um, and eventually filed a class action lawsuit. And this went on for years. So Tenant, Wilbur Tennant contacted Bilot in the late 90s and um, Bilot didn't win this class action lawsuit until 2004. And, and even then, the, the result of the 2004 lawsuit was that DuPont had to agree to pay for a scientific study 
hoping to prove the link between PFOA and effects on human health. And if if that study proved that there was a link between PFOA exposure and health effects, DuPont had to agree to fund this study. And in 2012, after processing a huge amount of data, the, the huge amount of volunteers who had been exposed to PFOA through the water, for example, they, they did prove a link. A panel of independent scientists proved a link between PFOA exposure and health effects that, that we dis- discussed earlier. For example, increased cholesterol. And then this resulted in um, several personal injury lawsuits and DuPont eventually settled these lawsuits for hundreds, hundreds of millions of dollars in personal injury compensation. The story of DuPont and PFOA serves as a reminder of the importance of safety and toxicology when thinking about macromolecular chemistry. These are things I do not think are talked about enough, especially when you compare it to um, the environmental effects of polymers such as plastic pollution in the oceans, which are talked about quite a lot, and rightly so, because they are significant issues which need tackling. But PFAS, for example, I believe isn't as well known about. So this is why I've decided to make this video. And it's still relevant today. It's ever more relevant. For example, 99% of Americans have PFAS in their blood, this harmful substance in their blood, as a result of, for example, DuPont polluting water sources with PFOA. But it's important to remember as well that progress is being made to deal with this problem. For example, in 2021, the state of Maine in the USA passed a law which aims to phase out PFAS completely by 2030, basically banning it from <clears throat> being used in any products by the year 2030, apart from really essential products where you, you can't really phase out its use. I'd just like to take a moment at the end of the video to thank you for watching and listening to me talk about PFAS and macromolecules. I hope you have learnt something and that you enjoyed the video. Thank you.